We've got some interesting and unique uh, subject material this morning. I'll let you decide for yourself if you agree with that statement here in a few minutes. But we're going to talk about the Genesis global flood of Noah and the Bible and science. What about dinosaurs? And I think that's a subject we're all interested in, curious about, children especially. I get more eyeballs up here when I give uh, this sermon probably than any other, uh, including my own, my own children's. Um, lots of pictures, a lot of interesting information. I hope you find it helpful this morning. Uh, we're going to begin by talking about the Genesis global flood of Noah. We've talked already about the fact that if you can't trust the first book in the Bible, how do you trust anything that follows it? That's why Genesis matters. If you can't trust what the Bible says about creation, how are you going to trust what the Bible says about salvation? And four of the first 11 chapters in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, concern the global flood of Noah. Next to creation, it's the greatest physical event that's ever happened in the history of the, of the earth. Uh, nothing like it has happened since, nor will, until the ultimate destruction of the earth. You know, we talked about how not only is the credibility of Genesis in question, if this event didn't occur, but so is the credibility of the rest of the Bible and everything that follows. All but three New Testament books reference or quote the book of Genesis, including Jesus himself, many doctrinal arguments, uh, things like baptism and uh, 1 Peter are tied to uh, the, the global flood of Noah. And yet it would be difficult to find any other, uh, more ridiculed event recorded in the Bible than the global flood of Noah. That was not always the case. For centuries, scientists looked at the features of the earth and attributed them in part to the global flood of Noah. It wasn't until Relatively recently, with Darwin's macroevolutionary theory, within the last 150 years, and the development of evolutionary geology along with that, that many have been re-examining uh, the evidence and what we see in Earth's features, and that the, this event, the global flood of Noah, has come under increasing scrutin, uh, scrutiny and ridicule. And so before we get into the evidence that this event actually occurred, that this actually happened, that's an historical event, I do want to just mention briefly that it's my studied conviction that one of the contributing factors that led into this catastrophic event like the world's never seen was in part due to the fact that good people intermixed and intermarried with bad people, perhaps based on physical beauty instead of spiritual beauty. And I want you to take that lesson to heart. It's a very, very important lesson in the results and consequences of those decisions. So with that said, we want to begin... Maybe. Off to a great start. <laughs> there we go. So, so much of the controversy relates to the age of the earth. How old is the earth? Because we've already talked about a 14 billion year old universe versus the six to 10,000 years you seem to get with the genealogies in the Bible that are very clear about that. There's a huge difference between those two worldviews. And so, so much of this debate and controversy relates to how old is the earth. And I want to give you just briefly a few reasons why the evidence points to a young six to 10,000 year old earth. Earth's decaying magnetic field. There's a huge current at the uh, core of the earth that causes uh, the arrow on a compass to point north. That force or that current is weakening over time. In fact, some believe that by AD 4000, it might be completely gone. If that rate of decay is constant, and that's what evolutionists believe, uniformitarianism, we're going to talk about that everything stays the same. If that rate's constant, as they allege, then the earth could be no more than 10,000 years old. The amount of hydrogen in the universe. Hydrogen converts to helium, and it doesn't convert back to hydrogen. So if the universe is truly billions of years old, there should be no more hydrogen. It should have already all converted to helium, and yet that's not the case. The vast amounts of hydrogen in the universe are a testament to a young Earth. The lunar recession rate. The moon recedes, gets farther from the Earth every year slightly by four centimeters. So 6,000 years ago, it was the, the moon would have been uh, 750 feet closer to the earth than it is currently. That would have had a minimal impact. Yet if uh, the moon is billions of years old, that is a significant problem because one billion, roughly one or one and a half billion years ago, based on that lunar recession rate, 
the moon would be touching the earth. That's a significant problem. Comet contradiction. The comet is made up of ice and dirt. And these comets are said to have formed at the uh, original formation of our solar system some several billion years ago. We obviously don't believe that or accept that. But as these comets orbit around the sun, as they get closer to the sun, radiation and solar winds will blow out some of that ice and some of that dirt. So each time it goes around and gets closer and it has more and more material blown out, eventually it's going to disintegrate. And so the average lifespan of a comet is said to be roughly 10,000 years old. How can the solar system be billions of years old if we have thousands of comets thought to have been formed when the solar system was initially created? How do you explain that other than a young earth? And there's so many other numerous examples we could go into. Uh, population statistics are another fascinating, compelling argument for a young earth. Uh, according to historical records, the human population doubles every 35 years or so. And let's suppose mankind begins with two people. Let's, for the sake of argument, call them uh, Adam and Eve. And let's suppose man's been around for a million years. That's conservative because evolutionists would say, well, two to three million years. But let's just say one million uh, to be conservative with our numbers. And let's suppose we give uh, each generation last 40 years. Each family has two and a half kids, which that's conservative too. They like, had a lot more than that in the past. Allowing for wars and famine and disease to wipe out large number of people. If man has been around for a million years, there should be one times 10 to the 5,000th power of people on the earth, according to human population statistics. And you're thinking, well, what does that mean? The universe itself at 93 billion light years in diameter, remember we talked about the vastness of the universe, how incredibly large our universe is, even compared to the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal and humbling. It's hard to wrap your mind around it. It's so big. The universe itself at 90, we're not talking about the earth, the universe itself at 93 billion light years in diameter could only contain one to 10 to the hundredth power of people. Not 5,000th power, hundredth power. The universe can't even hold the amount of people that should be on the earth a million years later. How do you explain that? And yet if you start with eight people post-flood, according to population statistics, today you would have a roughly six to eight billion people, precisely the amount of people living on the earth today. So if the a Genesis, uh, the global flood occurred, you would expect to find evidence of that. We're going to present that evidence. Then you would expect to find historical evidence. It, this was a huge event. And so if it happened, there should be a historical record, uh, oral tradition, stories. This is something you talked about and you passed down. If you survived this, the, the eight people that survived, you pass it on to each generation. You would, you would expect historical confirmation, evidence, stories of this event. And that's, in fact, what we have. An abundant amount of flood legends. Some estimate 200 to 500 of these legends that tell virtually the same story with minor differences but you see here, uh, 95%, the flood was worldwide. It wasn't a local flood. It wasn't a regional flood. It was a global flood. 88% a certain family was favored, and 70% survival was by means of a boat, and 67% animals were saved, and 66% the flood was due to man's wickedness. Here's a chart that just gives a few of these flood legends in different countries, different parts of the world. And you see here the, the Genesis account, the details of what happened. So you see the, the full boxes are a full representation. The partial boxes are a partial representation. So what naturally happens is over time, some of the details were lost or were changed. You think about the, the telephone game or whatever as time went on. Just like a fish story, the, 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 the fish gets bigger. Certain details get changed. But the fundamental story of a global flood of a certain family being favored or saved, etc., being saved by a boat on a boat stayed the same. It's interesting, some of these legends, like the Hawaiian flood legend, uh, the man that was saved is Nu'u. Sounds very similar to Noah. And the Hindu flood legend, Manu, is also very similar, if you study that name, to the name Noah. In one legend, um, a man by the name of Dumb uh, was saved, and evidently he was a lot smarter than his parents thought that he would turn out to be. And so not only would we expect historical evidence for a global flood, we would expect physical evidence. We've talked yesterday, we, we challenged the, the burden of proof. Macroevolution produce missing links, and they produce uh, glue and pig's teeth and glue it together. And so the burden of proof, we say, where's the evidence? If this happened, where's the physical evidence? Where's the body? 
And so the same with the flood. If a flood occurred, we would expect there to be not only historical evidence, which is compelling, but also physical evidence. The Bible makes it clear that all the mountains were covered, that every living thing was killed, was destroyed in the flood if it wasn't on the ark. And so the Bible makes it clear, you can't reconcile the fact, this was a global event. This was a universal event. It wasn't a flash flood, a local flood. Think about this, if sometimes Christians try to, just like with evolution, try to harmonize these theories with the Genesis account, and they'll try to say, well, yeah, it was a regional flood, or it was a, a story, or just to teach principles or lessons. If this was a local flood, just a regional flood, a hundred years would have been plenty of time for Noah and the animals to just go somewhere not local, go somewhere else. Walk some, why in the world are we going to build an ark and have animals come to this ark if we can just go somewhere else? People say, well, how could all those animals have fit on the ark? Ask them if they appreciate how large the ark was. Some of you may have been to the ark encounter in Kentucky and you get a visual representation or feel of just how impressively large over a hundred years uh, that that ark was built it's absolutely uh, humongous so, uh, I think it's roughly a hundred thousand square feet of area if you go through all three levels um, 450 feet long 75 feet wide 45 feet tall uh, some you know Whitcomb and Morris in their book on the flood great book on the flood talk about and argue and show that all these animals could in fact fit in the ark with room to spare. Essentially, the space is like 520 cars, like on a freight cars, uh, worth of storage. And also understand that you wouldn't have had to take every uh, type, with, uh, variation within types of animals. You could have taken the broad categories of animals. And then after the flood, that breeding or the diversification, the variation, the micro not macro evolution we talked about yesterday could have occurred post-flood. So you wouldn't have had to take all the different breeds, all the different kinds within the kinds, but just the broad categories and that diversification could have occurred later. Also, you could have taken animals in a younger state when they were uh, more immature, when they were smaller, they didn't eat as much, etc. Jesus, in talking about the flood, uses a word, the word here for flood that he uses in the Greek is not the typical Greek word for a flood of water. The word in the Greek here is cataclysmos, where we get the word cataclysm. It's a cataclysmic event. It wasn't a local event, it was a universal event. In fact, Peter uses the same word in 2 Peter 3 in talking about the destruction of the world and impending judgment. That's not a local event. That's not going to be a regional flash flood. That's going to be a universal event. And the Bible makes that clear. And we have physical evidence all around us including under our feet, that prove this global event occurred. Some great examples of this in our country, the Grand Canyon. Uh, the second largest canyon, uh, the Paladero Canyon in our own backyard, is evidence that this event occurred. And yet we're told because of uh, evolutionary uh, theory and, and uniformitarianism we're going to talk about and gradualism, that these canyons were formed very slowly this mythical nature between Mother Nature and Father Time, somehow these canyons were formed through that union, and that the Colorado River carved out the Grand Canyon, even though the Grand Canyon's higher in elevation, <laughs> so it was the ultimate little engine that could. Um, the Prairie Dog Town Fork of the Red River is said to have carved out the Paladero Canyon, and if you've seen the Prairie Dog Town, it's, especially lately, uh, it must have been booming at one point, uh, but it certainly isn't today. So, again, our worldview has a tremendous impact on the inferences, the interpretation, how we look at the data. And the evolutionary worldview is one of gradualism and uniformitarianism. And, again, don't get psyched out by big words. Uh, understand the concept. Uniformitarianism says that the key to understanding the past is the present. Everything's uniform. Everything stayed the same. Nothing's changed. And so whatever processes or rates that we observe today is exactly how things were in the past. It's always stayed the same. In fact, Peter talks about uniformitarians in his day. In 2 Peter 3, when they were saying, nothing's changed, everything's continued from creation as it's always been. And that's when Peter says, things have changed. There's been a flood, a global flood, and things will change again. But that's not a new uh, concept. In contrast with catastrophism, which says that many of the features we observe, many of the rates and conditions could have changed or been accelerated or been different due to catastrophic events. 
like the global flood of Noah. Coal formation, petrification, the formation of oil, the carving of canyons, radioactivity, uh, nuclear decay rates, all those things, all those processes have been shown to be able to speed up significantly and form in a very short amount of time during catastrophic conditions. Let me give you an example of that. Mount St. Helens, some of you might be old enough to remember that eruption in 1980 in Washington. And uh, basically the amount of energy that was produced by that was the equivalent of 20,000 atomic bombs we dropped on Japan. And so since then, we've been able to study uh, some of the effects from that eruption New strata over 6,000 feet deep have been laid in the years following. So that shows you, remember we talked about the flood and the geologic column and things like that, uh, that those layers were laid very slowly over millions of years. That illustrates that these strata, this, these layers 6,000 feet deep can actually be formed, deposited, laid down over a relatively short period of time, not over millions of years, under catastrophic conditions. Canyons were formed in six days. One canyon 140 feet deep was formed uh, in one day. And that again shows that under catastrophic conditions with a lot of water and other geologic events, these things can happen in a relatively short amount of time. So let's go back to the geologic column that you'll probably have studied or will study in your science classes. And it's presented as fact. You say the geology, it's a fact, right? They present it like it's been proven. You're going to find it all over the world. The truth is you will not find the entire geologic column anywhere in the world. <laughs> anywhere in the world. It's purely an invention by geologists based on, again, evolutionary assumptions. According to the evolutionary theory, the life record in the various strata goes back 2 billion years. Yet if these earth layers are to be found anywhere on the earth... Two billion years of these layers, if this whole column was intact somewhere, they would extend 130 miles deep. That's a problem because the layers that have uh, fossils in them only go back uh, 12 to 15 miles deep. And in fact, Earth's crust is only 25 to 30 miles thick, not 130 miles deep. That's a significant problem. That's why you're not going to find this column anywhere. And yet we're told that the Grand Canyon is one of the best examples of the geologic column anywhere in the world. Here's uh, the, the layers that are in the Grand Canyon and all the layers that are missing from the Grand Canyon. That supposedly is the best example of the geologic column anywhere in the world. Is it possible the Grand Canyon was formed very rapidly, a lot quicker than evolutionary theory asserts? We talked yesterday about ca the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian layer is towards the bottom, one of the oldest layers according to evolution. Uh, not very old, one of the first laid down very rapidly in the flood. But we talked about the Cambrian explosion and how that's a perplexing problem for evolutionists. Even uh, Richard Dawkins talks about how it's just like all these fossils that explode all of a sudden are like they were planted there. And that cre creationists have delighted in that. We certainly have. The Cambrian explosion was the most remarkable and puzzling event in the history of life. We read the quote about if I take the Cambrian explosion on its own, the logical conclusion I would draw is, wow, it was created. And so you have this explosion of fossils, of life forms, all at once without any evolutionary ancestry that you would expect to find leading into them. There's virtually little fossils below the Cambrian layer leading up to it. No evolutionary ancestry. And this explosion of even complex, like the trilobite we talked about. Complex creatures, not simple to complex. Complex from the very beginning. And an explosion that you would expect to find. A lot of fossils happening all at once during a flood. Buried in water and mud and preserved often uh, by that mud. How do you explain that? How do you account for that? It's exactly what we would expect from a creationist perspective. That there would be some indicator that a flood occurred. There's a line in the lower base level of the Cambrian strata or layer known as the Great Unconformity that curiously stretches across the entire planet, the entire world. And above that line is an explosion of these fossils. Exactly what you would expect. That line represents the commencement of a global flood. Some other additional evidence. Coal beds are not being formed today. According to uh, the, the evolutionary, macroevolutionary perspective, coal beds were formed again gradually, slowly. Uh, Mother nature, father time. 
uh, producing these coal beds. Vegetation was hardened and pressed by rocks uh, above them in swampy areas over and over and over and over over millions of years. Creationists would contend this coal was formed by floodwaters, by the pressure of the, the tons of earth and rock b that uh, buried vegetation and produced massive coal beds in a relatively short period of time. And there are no coal beds being formed today. Uh, there are no evolutionary changes in the coal record. You see the quote there, in the coal period, which was supposed to have lasted millions of years and to have submerged over and over again, the vegetation remained the same. It was practically identical over the world, and evolutionary assumptions do not seem to be very consistent with the facts. There's no, with the vegetation over millions of years, supposedly that produced the coal, there's no evolutionary evidence of, of changes in that record, in the coal record. How do you explain that? Polystrate fossils including polystrate tree trunks. Poly means multiple, straight, strata. So this is, these are fossils that are in multiple layers. Now think about that. If each of those layers represent eons of time, millions of years, laid down over millions of years, how do you explain fossils that got into multiple layers, millions of years apart? How, do you, how did a tree get buried to where it's dead and its, its roots are dead, and yet it's sticking up out of that layer while it's covered with another layer over millions of years. How do you explain multiple uh, fossils in multiple layers of the strata? Polystrate fossils are uh, amazing evidence for the fact those layers were laid not over millions of years, but over a short period of time during a, a flood. Vast fossil graveyards we see all over the earth, including dinosaur graveyards we're going to talk about here in a moment, where you go to places in Colorado or Utah with these fossil graveyards of dinosaurs that were all buried together, and it's abundantly clear they died in a flood. And you'll read about them, and they'll admit they died in a flood, but they're quick to point out it was a local flood. It was a regional flood. It was a flash flood. But you have these graveyards of fossils all over the earth that indicate these creatures died in a flood event. Uh, some of them have been remarkably preserved uh, due to that, that rapid burial. Here's a, a fish caught in its last meal or another marine reptile below uh, that get, uh, died during childbirth. How do you explain marine fossils? Those are uh, creatures from the ocean, from the water. How do you explain marine fossils on the tops of mountains like the Himalayas 20,000 feet above sea level? The only explanation even uh, the Grand Canyon and Power Duro Canyon have these marine fossils that are also thousands of feet above sea level. The only explanation is these mountains, these areas were at one time all covered by water, just as the Genesis account states. Rapidly deposited sediment layers found across vast areas. Chalk beds of southern England can be found all across Europe. Limestone in, uh, from the Grand Canyon can be found all over the U.S. and the Canada, even a over into England. How do you explain that? We find ripple marks and rock layers that show water currents were at one time moving from the northeast to the southwest in all of North and South America. How do you explain that? How do you explain the rapid or no erosion between layers, between strata? I think uh, I heard an illustration. If you took a, made a cake with multiple layers and put it outside, in just a few hours or a few days, you would see erosion between scavengers, he, all kinds of things would work. You would see erosion between the layers. How do you explain in all these places there, you find no erosion? Even though they were laid over millions of years, there's no erosion between the layers. Could it be they weren't laid over millions of years? They were laid very rapidly at the same time. Additionally, rocks don't normally bend. They break because they are hard and they're brittle. But in many of these places we find uh, in, the, in this, these layers, the strata rocks that are bent without breaking, like they were folded while still wet and pliable before final hardening. So at this time, we're going to have a stand and we're going to have a song. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the Bible and science. What about dinosaurs? Mark your books to number 922. So I wanted to study the subject of dinosaurs because dinosaurs have essentially become the poster child for the theory of evolution. It's the, the icon of macro evolution. It's what the, the lizard and the pig are to Geico, right? It's the icon of evolution. 
And often, unfortunately, Christians and Christian parents and teachers have just simply ch chosen to ignore them or pretend like they never existed. In fact, uh, sometimes uh, parents have told when asked by their children, what about dinosaurs? They'll tell their kids, well, dinosaurs aren't real. Dinosaurs never existed. Or quit asking questions. Or just have faith and the blind faith we talked about and discourage questioning. And I want to tell you that's not acceptable. And that's not credible. It's not compelling. And if they can go on the internet and other places and find evidence that dinosaurs were in fact real and did in fact exist, what if they begin to question, what are you telling me exists that doesn't exist? And it can undermine and destroy our credibility. Kids are going to learn about these things somewhere. It's kind of like things I learned in the locker room and other places in school. It'd be better for me to learn some of those things from my parents or from a Christian worldview and perspective than from somebody else. They're going to learn about dinosaurs from somewhere. The question is where and from who? And if they don't learn it from us, they don't learn it from you, they're going to learn it from some ev evolutionary, uh, atheistic perspective or worldview that's going to begin to spill millions and millions of years ago in a land before time. No animal has captivated the human imagination, the human attention, <laughs> we can see, more than dinosaurs. You think about all the movies and all the shows and all the books and all the advertisement to make money and money and money. It's been done, especially uh, towards a, uh, an audience of children uh, in dinosaurs. Jurassic Park, uh, my yearbook from first grade, actually the cover of that yearbook is the Jurassic uh, Park emblem. Uh, Land Before Time came out the year I was born in 1988, and I watched that movie over and over and over. I loved that movie. Uh, who can forget America's favorite purple dinosaur? Now, I'm proud to report I was not as interested in Barney. I was more of a Ninja Turtle guy, but he bebopped and hopped around the stage teaching kids manners to say please and thank you. And who can forget that song? Uh, the I love you. And I, uh, I apologize sincerely. If you have that song stuck in your head the rest of the week, I sincerely apologize. That is not something you want in your head. Uh, please don't sing it. Um, <laughs> all kinds of movies, uh, even uh, rec more recent movies uh, that have come out. And so they're used to make money, but they're also been used and they've been exploited by evolutionists to spread false evolutionary propaganda. And the irony is they're used the exact opposite way God used them when I believe he describes dinosaur-like creatures in Job uh, 40 and 41, behemoth and Leviathan, to impress upon Job his unfathomable power. All the things I've made, we talked about that. We should appreciate the size of our God that made those things. And so they were used to glorify God, to show and make an impression about God's existence and His unfathomable uh, power and His omnis. And yet they're used today to do the exact opposite. To undermine special creation, to undermine belief and faith in God, and to teach macroevolutionary theory. These types of pictures are shocking, even to Christians, because we've been brainwashed so much to believe that dinosaurs and humans did not coexist. According to the theory of evolution, dinosaurs went extinct millions of years before humans evolved and arrived on the scene. And we were talking about this uh, yesterday. Uh, Jared has kept uh, pictures like this sometimes in the, the cotton gin. Uh, that he runs. And it's a great conversation generator. If you put a poster like this in your office or somewhere in public, you're going to get questioned about it. You're going to get some care, even from Christians. And that can lead to Bible studies and discussions, and, and you can build credibility with people. Um, so here's a poster from Apologia Express, and underneath it, it's quoting Genesis 1, 28, uh, have dominion over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And that would include certainly dinosaurs. Here's a, a younger child uh, leading, um, I think maybe a stegosaurus. I might have that. No, triceratops. Sorry. Triceratops, right? Um, Genesis 1, you see that the Bible and macroevolutionary theory cannot be reconciled. We talked about that some yesterday. Evolutionary teaching concerning dinosaurs stands in direct contradiction to what the Bible clearly states, which is all land animals and humans were created on the same day, day six. So you don't have to do a lot of math. I'm not going to try to complicate things and get into all the technical details we got into yesterday. You don't have to do a lot of math, and you don't have to love math and science to know that if dinosaurs and humans were created on the same day, 
they had to have coexisted. At one point, they had to have lived at the same time, including the day they were created. Genesis 1 uh, teaches that everything, just like Exodus 20 teaches, everything was created in six literal days. And we talked about the problems with the day-age theory and other explanations to try to harmonize macroevolution with what's clearly taught in the Bible. Jesus said that male and female were created from the very beginning. Not uh, if evolution is true and the universe is 14 billion years old and man arrived two or three million years ago, that would be like two seconds before midnight on a 24-hour clock. That's a long time from the very beginning. And so our dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be looking for a long time. If you get out of concordance, you get out your strongs and you look for the word dinosaur, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find that word in the Bible. And there's a very natural and obvious reason for that. The term dinosaur, which means fearfully great lizard or reptile, was not coined until the 1840s. So the word did not exist when the Bible was written. You're obviously not going to find a word that didn't exist in the Bible at that time that it was written. But you're going to find... Other words in terms that describe dinosaur-like creatures. Job talks about a, in the book of Job, a sea monster. Isaiah 30 talks about a flying, fiery serpent. The psalmist talks about Leviathan. In Job, we see, uh, we read about behemoth and Leviathan. And some have tried to explain, if you look in the footnote of your Bible, sometimes people will say, well, behemoth was a hippopotamus. Well, if you look at the description of behemoth, it says his tail's like a cedar. That cannot be describing the six to eight inch stubby tail of a hippopotamus. It, we're told behemoth was chief in the ways of God. Well, that would be indicating God saying to Job, basically look at these things and, and the ch chief of the ways of God, the power of God. Who better, what better would describe that than a huge dinosaur? When there are elephants and other creatures still living today that are much bigger even than a hippopotamus. Uh, Leviathan was said to expel fire from its mouth and smoke from its nostrils. Some will say, well, that was a, cro that was a crocodile. Uh, you, you couldn't come near it. You couldn't pierce its undersides. You couldn't tame or control these beasts. They were so powerful and great. If you've seen swamp people, you know that certainly is not describing a crocodile. And so some will say, well, these are just mythical creatures. He was just making this up. Well, these are in a list of other creatures like ostriches and hawks and horses in the context of things that are real. God's making an argument. Look at all the things I've made. Where were you when, you made, when I made this? Do you understand how this works? Do you know all the laws of science we talked about yesterday? So if God was making something up, what would his point? Job would have said, so what? Those things aren't real. What's your point? These were real creatures. These were dinosaur-like creatures. And so while the term dinosaur wasn't coined to the 1840s, Stories told previously of fearfully great reptiles would not have included the word dinosaur, but would have been described with other words such as dragon. And we have dragon legends all over the world throughout ancient history. The flood is not the only common remembrance of the world's cultures. They also remember dragons. From England to China, it's the imperial emblem of China. There were a long, uh, these were a long part of national mythologies. The Indians of North and South America had legends about them. They were written of in Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, Greece, Switzerland, Scandinavia, Ethiopia, Egypt, Persia, Russia, India, and Japan. How do you explain all these legends all over the world, independent of each other, before globalization, just like we talked about the flood legends. This was before Facebook. <laughs> this was before Twitter and ways and phones and ways of communicating all across the globe when these civilizations were isolated and independent from each other how do you explain they all told the same stories about the flood and about dinosaur-like creatures herodotus a respected greek historian who wrote and lived uh, around 450 bc talks about these creatures josephus a famous jewish historian around the time of christ talks about these creatures the Bible also describes dragon-like creatures. We read in Isaiah 30, verse 6, about a flying, fiery serpent. What better description of a dragon than a flying, fiery serpent? Leviathan, who could expel fire from its mouth and smoke from its nostrils. Evolutionist Mark Norrell admitted that all the mythical creatures have real underpinnings in biology. So even these mythical creatures man makes up, there's some basis for them in real life, in biology. So what real animal is the basis for these dragon legends? 
Some dragons were clearly inspired by real-life animals long familiar to the zoological world. There is no doubt that dragons and certain dinosaurs, especially some of the larger predatory types, do exhibit a surprising outward similarity. Evolutionist Daniel Cohen admitted no creature that ever lived looked more like dragons than dinosaurs. But then he goes on to say, we have to assume that dinosaurs died out long before anyone could remember them. We must assume that dinosaurs have nothing to do with dragons. Why must we assume that? The problem is time. As far as we know, all the dinosaurs died out over 70 million years ago. That long ago, there were no people on the earth. So who could remember the dinosaurs? So the evidence says one thing, but we've got to assume something. We've talked a lot about that. (laughs) And we're going to continue to talk a lot about that. So if dinosaurs and humans coexisted, just like the flood, not only would we expect to find historical evidence, we would also expect to find physical evidence. Uh, They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so when we go places and see things, that are amazing, we take pictures of them to document them. They didn't have cameras back then to take pictures of dinosaurs like we could today if they still existed. But they had other ways of documenting the things they saw that impressed them. Uh, They could do cave carvings and drawings and things like that. And so I want to give you some examples of some of the physical evidence that humans in the ancient past, saw dinosaurs with their own eyes. In Southeast Asia, there is a civilization that flourished here back in the 8th to 13th centuries. In fact, a king built what's known as the Ta Prom, this monastery in the overgrown jungles of Cambodia. In this monastery are columns with depictions of people and planets and and other things that are real. And in this column, there's a very clear, as you zoom in, representation of what looks to be a stegosaurus. How do they know what a stegosaurus looked like in the 1100s? The Carlisle Cathedral built in the 12th century contains, one of the tomb, uh, contains the tomb of one of its bishops, Richard Bell. Along the exterior outside of that tomb is a brass, narrow brass fillet, again, depicting animals and things that are real And you see here, there are two images of what looks to be long neck dinosaurs. How do they know what long neck dinosaurs looked like in the 1400s, over 300 years before dinosaur fossils were discovered and reconstructed? On the underside of the Kachina Bridge in southeast Utah, this is uh, the third largest natural bridge in the world, are pictographs. And they represent mountain goats and people and human Handprints, real things, real creatures. And alongside uh, this human and this mountain goat and these other real things is what looks like a brontosaurus. And interestingly enough, there's a museum 45 miles away from this pictograph where fossils of brontosauruses are contained because they uh, were found in this area. What a coincidence. How'd they know what a brontosaurus looked like? This was believed to be the work of the Anasazi Indians, and they've dated the drawings and the rocks and all that and said, yes, it's uh, legitimate, it's old, uh, the work of the Anasazi Indians. How do these Indians know what a brontosaurus looked like? Francis Barnes, an evolutionist and widely recognized authority on rock art of the American Southwest, observed in 1979, there is a petroglyph in Natural Bridges National Monument that bears a startling <laughs> resemblance to a dinosaur Specifically, a brontosaurus with long tail and neck, small head and all. In the late 1800s, an archaeologist named Samuel Hubbard, who was an evolutionist, uh, went to the Grand Canyon and found many uh, pictographs of elephants and ibexes. One shows an elephant striking a man with its trunk. And when we find pictures like that, elephants and mammoths alongside humans, uh, we assume the inference, the observation is they had to have seen them. They had to have interacted with them to draw pictures of them at that time. And so this man, who's not a believer, who's an evolutionist, is not, uh, and, and is biased by evolutionary theory, goes to this canyon and finds one pictograph that was particularly interesting and amazing. You see here a dinosaur standing upright, sitting on its tail. Dinosaur tracks in that area prove their existence in that very area. His worldview was not dinosaurs and humans coexisted, but the facts, what he found was undeniable. And so he writes, the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon 
upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity or the age of man. The fact that the animal is upright and balanced on its tail would seem to indicate that the prehistoric artist must have seen it alive. Not only do we have pictures, we have figurines that have been made. Um, give you a few examples of this. In 1945, a German uh, hardware merchant, Waldemar uh, Jolsrud, found figurines, uh, 33,000 or so, in Mexico. And they were dated. Uh, he sent one's not, it was pretty wide. He sent one uh, a sample that didn't include dinosaurs. <laughs> and they dated them and said, yes, these are authentic. They're really old. And then when they found out that there were dinosaurs in this collection, they kind of backtracked because that doesn't fit evolutionary assumptions and evolutionary theory. But I want to point out something about that. If these were fraudulent, if these were forgeries made after the fact, more recent, there's a detail about sauropod dinosaurs that wasn't discovered even long after we started discovering fossil, dinosaur fossils and reconstructing, restructuring them, reconstructing them, that wasn't found until the 1990s. The fact that sauropod dinosaurs have spikes on their back. For a long time, until the 1990s, it was believed that sauropod dinosaurs had flat backs. And that wasn't discovered until relatively recently, in the 1990s. How do you explain these figurines depicted these dinosaurs with spikes on their back? They were found in the 1940s, before the 1990s. How did they know, even if they were forging them, a detail about dinosaur anatomy that was not discovered to the 1990s, if they weren't authentic. How do you explain that? The Ica stones of Peru that were discovered in the 1930s by Dr. Javier Cabrera, some 11,000 of these stones fill a museum, and some of them depict humans and dinosaurs in close interaction, sometimes the humans hunting the dinosaurs or leading them by the neck by a rope, They've dated hair samples and other things to confirm these rocks are old, are authentic. But again, even if they were fraudulent, even if they were f fake, how do they know in the 1930s that sauropod dinosaurs had spikes? When that detail of dinosaur anatomy was not discovered to the 1990s. The only way you can explain that is whoever created this saw dinosaurs, saw sauropod dinosaurs with their own eyes. So again, a lot of the controversy goes back to how old is the earth? How old are the dinosaurs? How old are humans? The opening scene of Land Before Time <laughs> is long before the monkey, long before you, was the age of the dinosaur. We've talked about for macroevolution to be true because it's so impossible statistically based on impossible events. They just keep adding time, thinking that more time will make those things possible. In Darwin's day, because he didn't understand the complexity of even a single cell, he believed 20 million years was sufficient. Now we have a 14 billion year old universe and that doubles, they say, every two decades or so. So how old is the earth? How old are dinosaurs? I'll show you something interesting. Uh, dinosaurs are said to have gone extinct 60 or 70 million years ago and yet they have found, here's one example, uh, 2005 this is from a T-Rex. They have found uh, soft tissue in these dinosaur fossils said to be at least 60 or 70 million years old, described as highly fibrous and flexible. Researchers were even able to squeeze uh, dark red substances from the blood vessel. How could something, how could soft tissue be found in something 60 or 70 million years old? In something that's not in a protected closed system and special, this is out in like Utah or places like that, subject to erosion and things. How can you explain that? Carbon-14 dating. We talk about these dating techniques that are flawed by evolutionary assumptions. I'm going to illustrate that here in a second. But basically, carbon-14 dating uh, dates things based on how much carbon-14, based on the decay rate of that element, how much carbon-14 is in this rock or in the, whatever it is. And then they date based on how much in the decay rate, how much is in there. They'll say it's this old. They find uh, carbon-14 in dinosaur bones, dinosaur fossils. How do you explain that? If there's 60 or 70 million years, there should be no carbon-14 <laughs> in those fossils. And yet we find carbon-14 in dinosaur fossils and coal and diamonds. All these things said to be millions and millions of years old. How do you explain that? What's really interesting is that no matter where these fossils are found in the geologic column, they all have essentially the same amount of carbon-14, roughly. They all fall within the same age range. Again, if evolution is true, at the bottom, there should be no carbon, there really should be no carbon-14 anywhere based on the millions and millions of years. But at the very least, the stuff you find at the bottom should have less carbon-14 than the stuff you find at the top. How do you explain it all has roughly the same age? 
other than those layers were laid down at the same time during the flood. So I want to talk about how these dating systems are flawed by assumptions. Radiometric dating, which uses the rate of decay of certain known elements to calculate the age of rocks or different things based on how much it's present uh, in the rock, and it's flawed by several assumptions. Assumption one, the rate of decay has always been the same. Uniformitarianism, that's never changed or couldn't have changed or been different due to catastrophic conditions. Let me illustrate that. Suppose you're watching a man saw down trees and you're watching him for an hour and he saws down one tree and you see five trees lying on the ground. What do you assume? If you believe that the rate's always been the same, how long has he been working? Five hours, right? What if he tells you he's only been working for three hours? What's the explanation? The rate changed. When he was fresh early in the morning and the blade was sharp, he was cutting down maybe one and a half or two trees per hour. The rate changed. It slowed down. It was different. That's one assumption. Assumption two, elements have not been affected by outside forces. Wind and water erosion that can affect the amount of those elements in those rocks. And finally, no mature element existed at the beginning. People talk about, well, it just looks so old. For one, what does that mean? Secondly, what did Adam and Eve look like the day they were created? What did mountains look like? What did the tree look like? How many rings were in the tree the day it was created? It was created in a mature state. People talk about the, the light years, and that has to be millions of... It was created in a mature state. To illustrate that, suppose you're watching a swimming pool that's 30,000 gallons in capacity, and it's been f being filled by a water hose that's running at 100 gallons per hour. There's 30,000 gallons now in that pool. How long do you think the water hose has been running? 30 hours. And yet you ask the owner of the pool, and he says, I've only been running the hose for an hour. What's the explanation? There was already water in the pool to begin with. So they're flawed by these evolutionary assumptions. Again, Jesus made it clear from the foundation of the world, from the beginning of creation, humans have existed. Romans 1, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. These things have been seen by humans from the very beginning of creation. When God created things, not millions or billions of years later. We talked a little bit about the day-age theory that people will say, well, those days are millions of years. Evening and morning, there's the context. And I want to also point out something I didn't mention the other day. We talked about the issues with plants being created the day before sunlight, how to survive without sunlight for millions of years. And there are many implications. It undermines the gospel. Did man rise or fall? Evolution has him rising. The Bible teaches he fell and was in need of a If we don't, didn't fall and sin, we don't need a Savior. But if evolution is true, death is a reality before sin, before humans commit sin. And if that's the case, then Christ's death can't pay for sin. And that's the case we've just undermined the gospel. And you think this doesn't matter? You think we don't need this intellectual stuff? We don't need to love God with all of our mind and engage our mind? But notice here it talks about seasons, days, and years. If days are symbolic or figurative or whatever we're trying to say they are, what do years mean? If days are millions of years, what in the world do the years mean? God's not trying to trick us or mislead us. He made it very clear what it, that the, all that was created was created in six literal days. So he says, well, I, don't, I just don't understand or I can't believe how dinosaurs and humans could have coexisted. How is that? And yet, look at all the things we've coexisted with even today. And we tame them and we teach them to do tricks because God's given us dominion over every living thing. So what happened to the dinosaurs? What happened to the dinosaurs? Well, one of the most popular theories is an asteroid hit the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. But if that's the case, why did other reptiles like alligators and turtles survive that? It's interesting. Some of the theories uh, that are put forth, uh, this is a real article. I uh, used the snipping tool on my computer, got on the internet, and this is from Fox News from 2012. Some researchers in England uh, believed that dinosaurs gassed themselves into extinction. The researchers calculated that prehistoric beasts pumped out more than 520, there we go again, million tons of methane a year, enough to warm the planet and hasten their own eventual demise. Until now, an asteroid strike and volcanic activity around 65 million years ago had seemed the most likely cause of the extinction. So they're theorizing that they essentially tooted themselves into extinction. That's the theories that have been put forth. So what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, obviously, a lot of dinosaurs died in the global flood. We have evidence of that. We've talked about that evidence. 
vast fossil graveyards all over it. So a lot of dinosaurs, like a lot of creatures, died during the flood. Did some dinosaurs survive the flood? Well, we've considered this morning there is historical and physical evidence that proves that dinosaurs and humans coexisted relatively recently, within the last few hundred years. And so, therefore, dinosaurs, some di- survived the flood, and if they survived the flood, they would have had to have been taken on the ark. So what caused the dinosaurs' ultimate demise? We don't know. It's like a lot of creatures that went extinct. Went, the dinosaur went the way of the dodo bird. I don't know what else to say. Uh, conditions changed after the flood. Maybe they weren't able to cope. The, the filling of the planet with human population, like a lot of things, uh, caused problems maybe for the dinosaurs. Remember, we're told that the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Every l- moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb I, have I given you all things. So in closing, I want to just mention real quick some key takeaways, some lessons learned from the dinosaurs. We talked about how Peter, dealing with uniformitarianism, all things have stayed the same, and he talks a lot about the flood. He talks a lot about the flood and makes doctrinal arguments based on the historical reality of the flood. But then he talks about there's something bigger. There's a greater destruction coming, the destruction of the earth. But it's all proof that God's long-suffering. God's been incredibly patient, giving them hundreds of years in the preaching of Noah to repent, to change, to escape. He's not willing that any should perish or that all should come to repentance. God does not want you to go to extinct, to be destroyed. In fact, he's created you with an immortal soul, with intrinsic value. He is the creator and sustainer of intrinsic value. We talked about that's why people go to hell. He's not going to destroy people made in his image. He's not going to destroy his image in things of intrinsic value. So seeing that the earth and all its works are going to be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting under the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, in conclusion, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Don't put your hope, your trust, your faith, your value in things that don't last, in things that are going to go the way of the dinosaur and the way of the dodo bird. Seeing these truths, what manner of person ought you to be in the way that you live your life right now? We also learn that science and the Bible are not at odds, they're not incompatible. And we've been emphasizing that a lot. The psalmist said, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Study science. God invites us to study. He gave Job a science lesson. We talked about, we rattled off all these ologies yesterday, all these fields of science. He gave him a science lesson. It's not science versus the Bible we got to quit doing that. So we're not going to win that. That's not, that's not what we're to be advocating for. That's, that, it's not science versus the Bible. It's science, true science versus false science. It's good science versus bad science. Reasonable faith versus unreasonable faith. Rational faith versus irrational faith. Don't let unbelievers hijack dinosaurs in God's creation to teach that God doesn't exist. We've got to take dinosaurs back and use them as they were intended to be used, like the rest of everything God's created to glorify God. And finally, when God wanted to reveal and manifest everything that he is and all of his omni, all of his omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, omnibenevolence, when he wanted to manifest all of his beauty, all of his power, all of his mercy, all of his grace, all of his love, all of his holiness. He didn't send T-Rex. He sent Jesus Christ, the express image of his person. You want to be wild and amazed by what God's created and the science lesson he gave Job and the vastness of the universe just overwhelms me. You can be impressed by that. You can be fascinated by a dinosaur. Be fascinated with Christ. Be mesmerized. Be in love with the beauty and the power of Christ. And get prepared for this cataclysmic, catastrophic event that's coming. Prepare your ark. Get in the ark, which is the church, the state, the realm of the saved. Be baptized into Christ. Peter said that eight souls were saved by water. The like figure wearing to baptism also now saves us. Prepare your ark before it's too late. Most important decision you'll ever make. Maybe you're here as a Christian. Maybe you're dealing with big problems. And if you're dealing with big problems and adversity, I want to invite you to focus on the size of your God 
instead of the size of your problems. When you do that, you'll dilute your problems and you'll give perspective to your problems. God is bigger. God is bigger than the monsters. He's bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Goliath. He's bigger than Behemoth and Leviathan and T-Rex. God is bigger than your sin. And God is bigger than whatever you're going through. When we look at the size of the universe, God is bigger than anything going on in your life. And yet in all of his power and all of his size, we said he chooses to inhabit the smallest of places, you and me. He invites you to let him do so. If you're here this morning and you need to respond to that invitation, the Lord invites you to come as we stand and sing.